Good afternoon, coaches. Welcome back to another e-workshop after our uh, break following our conference. Okay, today we our e-workshop will be infusing yoga training into coaching for athlete development. Okay, before we start, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. Okay, we'll keep one conversation at one time. I've muted all of your part this uh, mic. However, you can still provide your comments, input, response via the Zoom chat box. And we strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, we also strongly encourage you to switch on your videos. Yep. And then uh, actively participate in this e-workshop. Uh, actively, actively ask questions uh, from the to the presenter. Yep. Okay, today's e-workshop will be conducted by Ms. Danikato, who is a CDG recipient. So basically, uh, earlier this year, she attended the this uh, course, the Nervous System and Restorative Yoga Teacher Training course, which she has uh, learned quite plenty concerning yoga training. So in terms of uh, coaching background, she started coaching back in 2005. So so far has accumulated 15 years of coaching ex experience. And she's also an NROC member for 10 pin bowling and netball. So without further ado, let us welcome uh, Ms. Danekato to share what she has learned from the, from the course and how it can be infused into your coaching to help your athletes develop and uh, train better. Danika, please. Thank you, Chuan. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Danica, and I actually do see some familiar names and maybe some new names. Um, one, one request over here is, if it's possible, can you actually bring up your volume? Uh, this is just so that you can help me to ease my little throat issues over here that I'm dealing with. All right. So, I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm going to share a little bit about myself. Okay, so as Chuan has shared, you know, we, I was offered this opportunity to do a scholarship uh, with Sport Singapore, which uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And just a little bit about me, um, something that probably Tran did not, uh, haven't have yet to actually share about myself. There are some other sports that I also do uh, in the course of my athlete life before and during my coaching time. And I've done some frisbee, dodgeball, boxing. And currently now what I'm doing is teaching. Um, I'm working with a lot of athletes and also people from the public. Um, teaching mindfulness, secular mindfulness, so science-based. And then yoga therapeutics is one thing that I work with. Um, whenever I have athletes who come to me, usually we, we do something based on their training program and we help them to, I actually help them to uh, improve on whatever that needs to be worked on to complement the training. Okay, and then I also do a little bit of uh, health and wellness performance coaching. So this is aside from some freelance coaching that I'm doing for netball and 10 pin bowling. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna cover something quite generic today. Yoga is a very, very big topic and some of us here might have already known or have tried doing some yoga. Um, however, I'm pretty sure that there are some participants here who are pretty new to yoga. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about what yoga is and debunking what are some myths and some truths to yoga. And then we'll talk a little bit more about yoga for athletes, which is probably quite new in Singapore. Or maybe you have heard or done some yoga for athletes, but it's pretty much quite big in the US and Australia and our neighboring countries, um, especially the Western countries. So the training that I have received uh, is a teacher that I've been learning from over the past years and she's in the US. So we're also gonna talk about the benefits of yoga for athletes in relation to sport training. So this might be something that you 
may be interested in, especially to apply into to apply into your sport training and your program. And we'll talk a little bit about the range of motion, uh, the different types of range of motion as well, because uh, yoga is pretty much a movement, a movement based uh, exercise and and understanding the range of motion a little bit better might help you to understand the concepts of yoga and how you can actually apply it into your training, uh, your training programs and your training plan. Then this next term is probably quite new to everyone. It's a term called parasitic tension. We'll talk a little bit more about it. It's got to do with muscle tension. Okay. And Leading on, we'll talk a bit about pain, perception, and performance. And I'm pretty sure that coaching over the years, if you, whether you're new or you have been doing this for many years, you will have come across athletes who have gotten injured. And even if they're not injured, sometimes they complain to you, say, hey, coach, my back pain, my this pain, and that pain. Right? So we can talk a little bit about that. And then we'll move into some yoga movement poses that might be able to apply to your sport. And perhaps a little bit of thinking for you on your end, what applies to you, because every sport requires different types of movement. Uh, some more lower body, some more upper body, and some is a combination of both upper and lower body. So finally, we'll look into some considerations for including yoga into your training program. All right. I don't really have my chat on box over here. So what I'm going to do is like what Tran said, just put your questions out there and perhaps along the way, towards the end, we'll address the questions if that's okay. All right. So just a gentle disclaimer note for everyone that this workshop um, is meant for our education as coaches who are doing uh, sports or not sure if there's anyone in the fitness industry, but it's meant for our education only. So it does not mean that, you know, uh, coaches... Uh, all of us after this workshop is okay to go out and teach yoga sessions. So this is just something that you need to know about because I have come across athletes who I've had chats with and they say, ah, oh, I don't really want to do yoga because last time this happened and my coach, you know, taught me some yoga moves and then I hurt myself, but I scared to, you know, tell somebody else that, uh, or tell the coach that I hurt myself. So now I don't want to do yoga. So we are trying to also work towards the safe teaching um, aspect of yoga. There are definitely some technicalities in yoga and I would like to encourage you to work with someone who is experienced in um, athletes, uh, yoga for athletes along the way if you are really interested in something like this. Okay. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to click next. Okay, so what are some truths about yoga? Uh, truth is that yoga is definitely more than just a physical workout. If you have practiced yoga before, you will realize that it trains the mind as well. Some practices of yoga, there are many, many different types. So um, some practices lean in more towards a still kind of practice. And some practices require you to hold um, the poses there for a period of time. And this actually does train a little bit of mental resilience and learning how to relax at the same time. And then you have those um, types of yoga, such as vinyasa yoga, that you know it's a lot more athletic, a lot more dynamic, and and does not mean that all athletes need to only practice vinyasa yoga. Sometimes they need the ones that you know uh, are more still because they have already been moving so much. Okay, so it's a mind and body practice, regardless of whether the practice of the yoga is the type of yoga is dynamic or whether it's more towards the still and slow paced, gentle kind of practices. So when it comes to practice, the sessions itself, the practices are also a combination of physical and mental exercises, of course. And yoga basically has the power to calm the mind and strengthen the body in the way that it, it can do you know, it's, it's work. And there are and have been lots of, uh, there have been lots of thoughts and, and impressions, especially in Singapore that, you know, I have to be uh, flexible to do yoga and, 
you know, like when someone hears the word yoga, it means that it's all about uh, complicated poses and fancy poses. So the truth about yoga is that it's actually for everyone if we find the suitable kinds of practice for ourselves. So I think I missed one slide here. So some myths that, that came along uh, the way is that, you know, you have to be slim to practice yoga, I have to be flexible. Um, some practices that requires holding longer period of time, uh, it, it's not just about holding the pose there and waiting for the time to be over. There are actually things that can be worked on when holding a posture over there, such as an engagement of a particular smaller and um, a smaller supporting muscle rather than a larger muscle group. Okay. Uh, also, some people stay away from yoga because they think that they're too stiff and it's not suitable. But people who actually are stiff should do some yoga. And then, like we said earlier on, yoga is um, not about having to achieve fancy poses. There are therapeutic effects to it as well. Okay. Now, let's talk about what we are probably more interested in, which is how, um, or rather, what is yoga for athletes? So when it comes to talking about yoga applying for athletes, um, I think just based on my personal experience and personal feedback, you know, from the athletes that I have taught yoga to, uh, they always mention, uh, it really helps me to de-stress. And previously when I was working full-time as a, as a netball coach, um, where my athletes are training basically at least five times a day, sorry, five times a week, my bad, five times a week, they they will always say, oh, this is really helpful because, you know, training every other day just really causes the whole body to stiffen up and become quite, quite tight. And so yoga itself helps them to create mobility, especially, let's say, we have some sport that includes a lot of um, swinging, racket um, kind of sports. Very often, the shoulders might be rounded, not because they want to round the shoulders, but because, you know, they are, they, 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 they kind of engage certain muscles that, that causes the, the posture to, to actually round in. So it also lowers their stress. That's the other one. It offers a variety range of motion, which we will talk a little bit about more later on. Um, when we talk about range of motion, we are talking about the muscles ability to stretch and shorten, um, the joint mobility, fascia. If you're new to fascia, Fascia is, um, I'm pretty sure most of us here uh, in our lifetime have eaten chicken uh, meat, right? Chicken breast meat. And sometimes under the layer of fat, our fat, there is this white color sheet um, that is just on top of the meat itself. So that sheet itself, humans, we also have it and it's called the myofascia tissue. So I call it fascia here so that we all understand a little bit better. Okay. So fascia wise, it also helps with the range of motion of our joints and also the mobility of our muscles, the, the efficiency of our, our muscles moving. Um, one thing that will be really interesting later on for you perhaps might be the fact that range of motion comes with having to train up strength and flexibility. Okay, proprioception is another term and proprioception is when we talk about proprioception in the context of sport, we are looking, we're talking about balance. We are talking about the awareness of body. Um, I'm pretty sure at some point in your career, you would have met athletes or kids or youths that have two left feet. Two left feet means that they can't, just can't seem to coordinate themselves or they just can't seem to, you know, they, they just have a lack of body awareness. So um, proprioception in a way it's, um, the awareness of ourselves, our body, when let's say we're trying to do a single leg balance this way, this requires some sense of proprioception with this exercise here. Okay, and these are soccer boys. And so that's proprioception. Um, yoga for athletes also help to, uh, with recovery process, especially when it comes to injuries, or it can help with the recovery process from an intense training session. It can also you know, be part of a warm-up routine and a cool-down routine in its ways. Then finally, of course, 
I would say that yoga doesn't create the most, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't contribute to the most mental skills in an athlete's, uh, in an athlete's journey, becoming a strong athlete mentally. Um, I would still think and believe that psychology is psychology and mental skills training is necessary, but yoga practices can also help athletes to learn and fuel into the mental skills that they are already training or, or practicing. I can't seem to use my arrows. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of yoga and in relation to sport? So stress is, as we have mentioned earlier on, is one main thing that happens. And when we mention stress, we're not talking about our uh, very stress. Um, you know, I feel very stressed today because my studies are, my studies, uh, you know, I have exams or something on. But when we speak about stress, we are also speaking about physical stress. So physical stress, for an example, can be um, lots of interval trainings. Let's say somebody does 10 to 20 sets of short sprints, um, ratio two is to one, this kind of intense training, body is going under, the body will be going under a certain level of stress. And the mind will also start to race. And if you, if you have experienced also athletes before that when you are coaching them, they are fine. And then when they go to the competition, suddenly everything crumbles down and, and you know, like, don't know what happened. Like it was all fine during training. And that is the mental stress. So just to identify um, the different types of stress that can come about, especially in athletes or more applicable is um, that there's harmful stress, of course, and we call this distress, D-I-S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. And then there are, of course, low levels of stress where we also don't really want uh, athletes to have too low level of stress when it comes to performing in sports. So there is a middle level, middle space, where, experience, where athletes experience a level of stress that is healthy and that is beneficial, where stress is still creating motivation, alertness and energy, you know, helping them to think clearly uh, when, when they have to make certain decisions in, in the game, in their races, okay? And, and the body is able to function effectively and efficiently as well. But whenever, you know, um, whenever athletes find themselves in this very heightened state. And that's where sometimes they black out, sometimes they underperform, okay? So both the high and the lows here can lead to underperformance or even um, burnout and stuff like that. So yoga is a way to help uh, regulate stress for athletes and it can do that. So this is a food for thought. Movement is fundamental. And the, one of the reasons why I have moved from, I'm still doing some coaching, but a lot lesser now as compared to past, the past. And one reason why I moved to doing this that, that relates more to mind and body work is because in the years of my coaching, I realized that you know, a lot of kids don't know how to move and don't know how to move properly. And sometimes even basic crawling, crawling technique or even running technique, you know, it isn't really there. And sometimes we ask our, ourselves questions why this is actually happening. Okay, so that's why we dive into this and um, just remember that movement is actually fundamental. So let's talk a little bit about range of motions and the different types of it. We, um, I mean, of course there is a little bit more depth into range of motion, but we'll talk about the two main ones today. And the first one would be passive, and the second one is active range of motion. Let's talk about passive range of motion first. So passive range of motion happens when um, a person is in this stretch, for example, in this single leg stretch over here, and they're trying to maintain this joint connective tissue. So if you happen to be on the floor or if you're just trying to stretch down towards the ground from the chair, if you just feel it there and you just hold it there, right? Um, this is called passive range of motion because you are trying to hold there and stay there for, for a bit of time. I'm quite sure that most of us are familiar with um, range of motions, but we're just gonna run it through anyway, okay? To help you understand a little bit more in case there are new things for you to learn. 
So passive range of motion before athletic training exercises is not so ideal. This is one thing that I would uh, say to you because, I mean, I'm pretty sure that all of us now would have learned that dynamic stretches are a lot better than passive stretches before we start exercising. Um, the reason why is because research has found that when we do something like passive range of motion stretching just before exercise, the, the, the stiffness, the baseline of stiffness, so let's say I stretch something now, right? So once I stay here and stretch for however long I want to stretch, then once I unstretch it, it just takes 10 to 20 minutes for this muscle that I have just stretched to come back into its baseline. Baseline meaning if just now I stretch, uh, before I stretch, maybe this was the length of my flexibility, the, the, the tension of the muscle. After I stretch, maybe it increased a little bit. This increase lasts for only about 10 to 20 minutes. And after 10 to 20 minutes, it goes back to its baseline, which is just about here once again. So it's always good to start off with dynamic stretches, uh, dynamic movements before you start off something. Okay, so um, however, range of passive range of motion also does help with, uh, uh, I mean, does lead to, to decrease in performance, especially if it's done way before. So it's definitely more ideal to do it after, um, after the whole practice, okay. This is one thing that um, may be new to you or maybe not. Sometimes when you have an athlete who may have, say, sprained an ankle and doing passive range of motion at a time where it's acute may not necessarily help with staying off an injury later on. Okay, uh, maybe there are some question marks popping up right now, but uh, just hold that thought and, and keep that thought over there. Maybe we'll fill in the, the blanks later on. And just by doing passive range of motion itself does not help an athlete to reduce or prevent injury. Okay. Over here, decreases in muscle tenderness, stiffness are temporary. So decreases in muscular tenderness, stiffness are uh, temporary. So like I said just now, it just takes about 10 to 20 minutes for, for the muscle length to you know, come back to its original base. Now, active range of motion is a little bit different or way different from passive range of motion. So this Pose over here, for example. Let me just help you get the, uh, the picture first. If let's say this lady is not reaching this arm up over here and she is just reaching it down here, like how this guy is actually doing, okay? That is called passive, right? So by her just lifting this arm up and engaging certain muscles like over here, engage the abs, try to roll the shoulder open. If you're trying now, you can just give it a try if you're sitting down. If I'm just laying here, side bend over here, just by myself, this is just very passive. But the moment I engage the core, so now I'm drawing my belly in, I actually roll my shoulder open a little bit, assuming this is a side bend. And I feel these sides of the, the rib cage over here expanding and I'm engaging this, um, this whole line over here. This is more of an active range of motion experience. Okay, so if you happen to have some string or strap or whatever now, even if just by doing this, okay, I can't really show the whole thing, but even if just by doing this, staying here is a lot more effort than just, than just staying like this and resting. Okay, so this is the main difference between passive range of motion and, uh, and active range of motion. And active range of motion is where your muscles are actually still engaged. It creates, a, it creates stimulation for the bone and joint tissue. It, it keeps the integrity of, of the whole structure as you are trying to stretch. Excuse me. And when we are in active range of motion, what happens is usually when we allow ourselves to stay there and be active in that posture, it provides the, the body starts to send signals back to the brain, the nervous system, and it it, it kind of makes the, have the body continue to contract the muscles so that it's actually working. And when the brain registers that the muscles are actually still working, that is a little bit of activation work that is done over there. Okay. 
And yes, AROM can also help with um, the development of coordination and motor skills function. And that's why we are talking about movement. Okay. Now, so some questions you might be asking is, so now what, what is better? Is PROM better or is AROM better? So we would say that none of it is better. Both are useful and helpful to some extent. Um, so don't think that passive range of motion is actually bad and both are needed. Um, it's just that we need to think about if we are doing a stretching, uh, if we're thinking about you know, how warm up routines and cool down routines uh, should be crafted, it's really important to help with uh, the performance of your athletes during the session itself, whether it's a training or competition. So maybe it's just an opportunity for you to now rethink of what are some exercises do I want to uh, include in my warm up or cool down sessions? And what are some of the, the, the stretches that maybe it's good to eliminate because not all the stretches are needed to be done, you know, uh, uh, for our, our routines. Okay, so the quote is to put that range of motion into active use. Now, when we talk about range of motion, there are some factors that affect, that may affect range of motion and we call it DIMS and SIMS. So there is DIMS where we talk about range of motion and doing um, stuff that invo involves mobility. And this DIMS means that, you know, if you have gone, if someone is perhaps already quite stiff uh, and then they are going for a stretch and someone pushes that person and the person suddenly has this heightened, heightened sense of pain and shouts, ouch, right? Like uh, very alert and very shocked. And, and that is basically an experience of dangers in me. Okay. And then there are safety in me, safety elements in me. Um, SIMs, we want to, this is a factor that you want to uh, be aware of because Having building strength, for example, if we actually build strength, that's why I mentioned when we mentioned earlier on that strength and flexibility actually comes hand in hand to, to affect our range of motion positively or negatively. Strength is an element that helps to provide um, this safety element in our own body. Okay, there is one thing over here that, that probably I um, would like to, to highlight. Um, I may not be 100% correct, but one thing that we learn as uh, when during our teacher training, um, when we teach yoga is that there are also hyper uh, mobile people and hyper flexible uh, people. So for example, uh, sports like that might be uh, gymnastics where they are hyper flexible. So when it comes to athletes like that, then what are the considerations that do I want to um, uh, train to help these athletes to still have that safety in me. So I would say strength training is one uh, that would probably help not to bulk up, but strength training to, to help um, hold, hold the joints and the muscles all together. Okay, and range of motion is all about using it or losing it. So when we do active range of motion work, or passive range of motion work. Like just now I mentioned that, you know, PROM, the passive range, 10 to 20 minutes is gone. It's back to, I wouldn't say it's gone, but it's back to its normal baseline. Even active, um, the, the research have shown that even active doesn't stay forever. Okay, so if let's say today, one day I can stretch this much, it doesn't mean that 20 years down the road, I'll be able to stretch this much. This is just a concept that when it comes to range of motion, you know, if you want to continue being able to move towards the later stages of our lives or to help our athletes be able to perform and move the way that they can potentially move, it's all about using and tapping into the different types of range of motions and work everything together. Okay. So perception of pain is also one thing that can affect range of motion. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a short bit. Now, some other factors that can affect range of motion is definitely strength and flexibility. Not the first time that uh, we have spoken about this during the course now. 
strength is a basic foundation of range of motion. So that is what you want to remember. And then flexibility, I wouldn't say is the next, but they both come hand in hand. Okay, so if I'm thinking about wanting to um, have a think about or relook at my training program or training sessions, do I want to include both at the same time in, let's say, uh, my warm up routine to kind of complement both and have both there or anyway in my training so that it encompasses those elements or these elements into my, my own training program? and then um, to help complement the other aspects of my, my program plan. So as I said just now, it's not one that is first or second. They both has this, have this dual, duality function. And just something interesting that I've learned along the way is that there's a reason why there are some dots over here and that's like direct opposite. Because let's say this white is yin and then the black is yang and, and Inside this yin and the yang, there is still an element of yin inside the yang, and there is still an element of this yang inside the yin. Okay, so this is just a food for thought for yourself. Um, this is also the relationship of strength and flexibility. Okay, all in all, good muscular strength plus a wide range of motion equals to good range of motion. Now, if you don't know who he is, he's Cristiano Ronaldo, who kind of practices yoga as well. So why is moving more skillfully, as we mentioned earlier on, range of motion so important? That's important because it really translates into helping us. I mean, in the context of sports, it can help our athletes to reduce you know, risk of injuries. I'm not very... Oh, less, less mechanical stress is on the body as well. So I'm, I'm not very sure if it has happened to you before, but it has happened to me before that when I was coaching, um, I remember it was secondary school girls. And there was that period of time where I was not very actively involved with myself and my body. That was, that was my younger days. And when I was coaching them and, you know, um, sometimes we get into the moment of wanting to try to coach and be involved in that that exercise to show it to them and then sometimes we get injured ourselves so i have like oh i put my back for a little bit just because i overstretch a little bit of something and then that stretch or that pain lasts lasts for the next few days and and so it's all about you know training um i mean to move more skillfully we need to i mean it helps to reduce this mechanical stress on the body okay and it helps to improve efficiency in training and daily movement. So for us coaches, maybe a thought is, am I capable of you know, moving the way that I'm hoping that my athletes can move? Otherwise, do I actually want to be the one doing the, the example? Okay, better pain outcomes. What better pain outcome, outcomes mean is that um, by moving more skillfully, recovery, uh, recovery uh, lengths improve, right? It shortens and maybe athletes can come back from their recovery a lot sooner, a lot quicker than if they are quite stiff. Um, and the perception of pain may also improve as they go along. There's a fine, there's a little bit of a relationship between pain and moving skillfully as well. It's a lot deeper, but we will talk a little bit more maybe in, in the pain section. And moving skillfully generally is um, can help us to feel more at ease. Um, I'm very sure that there have been frustrations over the years coaching athletes also that, you know, sometimes why does this athlete not get it at all? I'm really trying to show, I really get someone to show um, to do this particular movement, to execute this particular something. And why is it that this athlete just doesn't get it? It's not that they cannot think, it's not that they cannot process, but sometimes maybe it's not there yet. So it's, it's trainable for sure, okay? Now, movement intelligence offers a way to empower both our athletes, students, and ourselves to make intelligent choices about their movement practice. So I'm gonna pause a while here, maybe allowing yourself to read it again and ask yourself, what does this mean to you?
Okay, we're going to move on. So this new term that all of us are probably wondering, what is this about? If you Google parasitic tension, you probably are going to get some other things aside from the body. Okay, uh, some other tension or some mechanical parts or something like that. So what exactly is parasitic tension? If you are trying to still pronounce it, it's parasitic. Okay, it's basically the uh, unnecessary recruitment of muscles that are not needed for the task at hand. Okay, so let's say, for example, you use the, the we use some uh, uh, examples here. So let's look at this lumbar lordosis where is where there's this anterior pelvic tilt of, of this person here, right? And we see this in a lot of girls, right? A lot of our female athletes, we see this. And then maybe in, we're not trying to judge people, but this is probably a, quite a common one. And then along the way, we also see some, you know, um, hunchbacks. This one comes probably from a lot of using um, our phones and uh, devices, okay, tech snacks. Okay, and then we have some that tends to enjoy leaning our hips forward. And somehow I see a lot of, uh, I see a lot more of this in, in boys in general. Um, so why we're talking about this is because now some of these postures are adapted Meaning, we, it could be genetic already, but some people, or most of us over here, have some form of parasitic tension in our body. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's say we have someone who started out with good posture. All of us are starting with, are starting with zero. We are all good, right? And then one day, we start to use the phone. Okay, so this is the posture I get myself into every single time using my phone. And slowly, 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 what's happening? is that the brain, nervous system, body, all connects up one together. And then after a while, this is what we're gonna get. Okay, so sometimes these days, instead of maybe looking at the screen, you know, in our phone, um, of course, nicely not to judge people, but just have a look around in the train station and just noticing the, the posture of, of um, some people there and notice what's happening in these people. And like I said, not in a way of, of judging, but just noticing, okay? so. This neck coming forward is an example of parasitic tension itself already. It means that we are using, the muscles are engaged without us even knowing that the muscles are engaged. Why did this person's neck become like this after a while from using the phone? It's because the body, the brain is very smart, but the brain doesn't know exactly what is right, what is wrong. So if we keep doing this, then the body is going to think, ah, okay, this is normal. Right, so the normal posture becomes like this. So that becomes a new normal. Okay, so coming back here, why does it happen? And it happens because muscle inhibition. Um, muscle inhibition means the ability to relax the muscles on command, means I'm telling myself to relax this shoulder right now. Okay, it's a lot more difficult than training muscle activation. So just now we do the side stretch, right? I want to train my muscle activation. I just want to engage the core, that's one. And then I want to try to, you know, fire by rolling my shoulder open. This is an example of muscle activation. So when I, when I do muscle activation, it's a lot easier than when I say, okay, now I'm doing this same stretch over here. But I notice, maybe I don't notice that there's this parasitic tension over here and my shoulder naturally just wants to keep doing this and I'm doing this instead. Okay, so this muscle inhibition means I'm going to tell this muscle now to relax, to slowly relax and then activate. So muscle activation is actually a lot easier than muscle inhibition, which is trying to tell the muscle, that particular muscle to relax. Okay, what, what our body is very happy to do always, our body and our nervous system, is to always um, uh, engage. It likes to engage a lot. So that's why when we use a phone or we start to stand a particular way, stand on one leg, and the body will start to adapt to that posture after a while. And then the pain becomes chronic. The way we move also gets affected along the way. All right. So when does it happen? It happens when we start to maybe lose awareness of the body. 
I'm going to come back to using the phone, for example. When we start using the phone, perhaps our eyes, our mind is on the phone and we forget what our body feels like. Okay. Learning a new skill. This is a very good one uh, in rel relation to our sport. If you think of an athlete that you have worked with before in your life, uh, in your career, uh, who came in probably new to the sport or came in with some experience, but have this certain general stiffness there. They look like they're not stiff in general, but they just look like they're so stiff and like they cannot coordinate and cannot catch ball, cannot move in a certain way. Um, so especially when it comes to new, learning a new skill where there's so much information going in. Okay, so parasitic tension can create stiffness when trying to learn a new skill, let's say in sport. Okay, so it's very important when we are coaching um, athletes to consider uh, managing the level of stress and, you know, instead of pumping, like pushing them at the start for so hard, what is the approach that might be best to, to, to uh, teach the new skill? Uh, it is a good strategy in the long run. For example, now we want to get uh, an athlete to be able to do this and say, okay, you do this now and now you try to shape, okay, you do, just keep doing, just keep doing this. And then the body starts to learn how to compensate. Maybe when we are supposed to use this muscle, um, the person starts to use this muscle, the neck muscle. And then the next thing you know, when they are, let's say, shooting a ball, they are using the neck instead of, of the arm, right? So just a, a, a food for thought there for you as well. Okay, but when we have athletes who use compensation along the way, in the long run, it doesn't really help them at all because they start, as they start to grow older, you will realize and you would already know that it takes longer for them to change. Um, so if they stay the same, the compensation, um, it will start to use more fuel consumption and, uh, and excess tension in the body. So let's say they're supposed to be able to maybe run a certain time in this distance, but maybe because of the way the posture is or the way they stand or the way they have learned a certain movement, they cannot reach that timing uh, at the time. How do you apply parasitic tension in real life? Where real life is very simple. Um, very first thing is when we're using our phone, it's not like using our phone is a bad thing or wrong thing, but perhaps just correcting and becoming more aware of the body posture in general. This can actually help to reduce mechanical stress of the body. And if we're talking about using the phone and text neck, then we're talking about, you know, this this stress in the neck that maybe later is going to cause degeneration in the cervical spine and also wear and tear. Okay, um, if, if we are more aware of the body, let's say now I start to adjust my neck back to, to, to more to center and more aligned, it can help to reduce the force of um, the force itself over here, the force going into the joints. Okay, in yoga, um, one thing that we always do is to work with softening the belly. I have come across athletes who tells me that they cannot breathe properly, especially when they're exerting a lot of force. Um, these, uh, one, one athlete that I'm working with now, he has tendencies to not be able to breathe when he has to do um, a certain amount of, a certain duration, a certain distance, and he has to keep going very, very fast. So uh, one way to help him to learn how to relax and breathe properly. The approach for me with him, because it was suitable, was actually to teach him how to breathe properly. Cause he was not breathing properly to begin with in, uh, previously. He was always just breathing here in the chest. So he was always just breathing here. And so whenever he felt tension, there was just a lot of tension over here. And so he, he started doing this and he was very stressed in general. So what we did was to work on belly um, softening the belly and slowly his whole posture started to ease off a little bit. Okay, and breathing can also help with parasitic tension. Uh, it, your scalene is a neck muscle over here in the costal muscles, uh, the, the muscles between the rib cages. So when we breathe, some people cannot breathe properly using that same example, is because there's a lot of tension all around. Okay, so by working on the breath can actually help. Um, assist the whole 
the whole uh, experience or journey of an athlete learning how to breathe effectively and efficiently. So some people, like my um, this athlete that I'm working with, he had lots of stiffness in his abdominal or abdominals only because he's always in this position, okay, and he wasn't able to breathe. So now I'm just going to guide you through uh, a little bit of uh, diaphragmatic breathing. You can choose to practice if you like to. It's just going to be for a short minute, but I'm going to encourage all of you to give it a try. Okay, so I can't see anyone, so it's perfectly fine. Um, what I'm going to get you to do is just to sit comfortably in the chair as best as possible without the backing. And then try to find a slightly more upright position and posture that is comfortable enough for you. And some of us, as we lengthen ourselves, we might find some stiffness here already. So if you find this stiffness, just allowing yourself to soften. Okay, we're trying to work with this muscle inhibition. Okay, so once you find yourself sitting here, maybe let the eyes close. Of course, whenever we open our eyes, sometimes the senses are so heightened. So just let our eyes close for a moment and then start to notice your breath. And as you notice your breath, notice where is this breath that you're feeling? Is it in the belly, in the chest or in the nostrils? And so let's say if you're paying attention or if you're noticing that the breath is in the belly, see how it's like to just pay attention to the belly here for a few moments with the breath. So breathing normally, not having to try to change the way that you're breathing. And then now seeing if it's possible to try to soften the belly each time when you exhale. So when you inhale, the belly rises, expands. And when you exhale, the belly softens, maybe a longer, slightly longer exhale. Okay, so this is just one example of diaphragmatic breathing and learning to help to apply um, uh, a release of, of tension or par rather parasitic tension in, in the body. Okay, I hope that's helpful to some extent. Now, just a little bit about elite athletes and athletes. Um, the difference between athletes and the ones that are more elite, this is um, Novak Djokovic, tennis player, is the fact that if you just visualize one elite athlete in your sport or that you can think of right now, a fan, how does this elite athlete move? Does he or she move very fluidly? Usually they have this movement where they, they kind of know the ins and the outs of the movement, right? And they look like they're very relaxed doing it. It's no, no stiffness at all. And, and um, you know, it seems like they are able to just perform everything very smoothly and comfortably and at ease. Okay, so usually elite athletes, if you want to consider helping to up our, our athlete's game or level, you can consider incorporating um, things like uh, yoga or you know simple breathing stuff into your training. Okay, this can also help along the way. This is not going to go away um, after one month, after two months. Okay, I'm talking about parasitic tension. So to help with eliminating parasitic tension, it takes time to practice. And if you're asking what has ROM range of motion, but I'll do with parasitic tension, all of them come hand in hand. And the third thing is pain, the perception of pain. Everything comes hand in hand. So if you're doing small elements here and there, some bits of targeting on some ROM, targeting on some you know, uh, yoga or, or breathing exercises just to release parasitic tension, the perception of pain is the next one that actually comes up and comes along. Okay. So I'm just going to run through this. This is an example to show that, uh, to share with you that there are some elite athletes around the world doing uh, some yoga to help them uh, deal with stresses. And for Tamsin Cook, uh, Australian swimmer, she uses these practices to help her battle her nerves because she's quite young. And for her, the main thing here is that it, for her, it helps her to be in a moment and let her body know that it's about to get into the pool. Okay, so it's like a pre-routine for her. It's a pre-competition routine, pre-training routine. And then I, I think Ryan Giggs got into some trouble recently, but 
um, with regards to Ryan Giggs and Roy Keane, some soccer players, team sports um, are also doing it. And for men, it's very, it's very straightforward. It's because most men in general are stiffer, which is nothing wrong with that. And we should all be proud about the fact that we are slightly stiffer because of certain structure. And there's always ways to open up the body and to help us move better rather than having to suffer in stiffness. Okay, so for him, mainly is to work the muscles that he doesn't necessarily use in his sport. Uh, and it makes total sense because if we are just going to keep using the same muscles over and over again, let's say I'm going to do bicep curl every day and just every day and just every day, this is all I'm going to get, the function of this particular bicep. So what happens to this one here and the smaller muscles inside around the biceps? So I can say I do tricep, I, I can do tricep uh, uh, pull downs or whatever also. So then again, we are only targeting the bicep and the tricep. So what about other smaller muscles that are not prime mover muscles? So some athletes feedback, just letting you read them. They feel more open, able to move better, less complaints of tightness with body. But then again, this one, they have to upkeep the practice. I have had athletes who came back to me and say, oh, Miss Dan, I have become so tight again because I stopped doing yoga. And, and so, you know, these are some uh, feedback. Feeling taller is normal because most of us to begin with are already a little bit rounded. So when we start to do a bit of yoga, a little bit of stretching in, in, uh, in those ways, the, the vertebras of the spine starts to have a little bit less compression and has a bit more space to breathe around it as well. Okay, coming to pain, the last one. So I'm gonna run things through in essence of time. Um, pain is a nervous system, it's a function of the nervous system and it's basic survival, okay? But poor coordination or muscular weakness can be threatening to the nervous system. And that's why there is this reaction to, to pain, right? And, um, but the thing about pain is that we need to know it's not entirely bad. And, and it's about, it's just a request for change. It's a, it's a warning signal. And it, it's just telling us that something might have happened to the body that results to pain. Okay, and what this does is, is that research has found that, you know, pain in general is also happening in the mind. So let's say now I'm feeling something over here. Okay, it's also happening in the mind. So if you're able to learn how to relax or able to learn how to work with the breath, and when we notice the pain as it arises, when it happens, and we notice how the pain is like, and then instead of reacting to that pain, the athlete starts to learn how to manage or deal with the pain, then the approach of dealing with pain can change. Okay, and the way that the, the athlete starts to recover from, let's say, an injury may also be sped up because of the fact that the perception has changed. All right, so I'm just going to breathe through this one. Um, now, how can we apply yoga to sport? In simple, applicable exercises is one way that you can do it. Uh, like I said, you might want to work with a teacher. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to share with you some exercises that, you know, can be applied into your exercises, uh, warm-up exercises and cool down. Okay, I'm just going to skip this one. Now, the first one is cat cow. I can't see you, so you can, and probably some of your screens are turned off. If you want to keep it on, it's fine, but you can practice. So a few things that you can note, and I think it's still safe to try it um, in your own time. And this one is good for warming up, okay? A few things you want to take note of is the, the, the stacking of the shoulder and the wrist alignment and the hip and the knee alignment, okay? And I have seen kids before when they do this, they try to whack their whole spine down. So it's about being gentle and asking them to, you know, feel like it's water, it's water rippling up and down and feeling the movement. What this posture does is the spine, is the mobility of the spine. Okay, so imagining all the way from the tip, the tip of the neck, all the way under the tailbone. So it's not just the middle spine that you're moving. The movement goes all the way to the tailbone over here and the neck over here. 
Now, Spink's pose is a modified cobra pose, which I will show you later. But these muscles that fire up, that are lit up over here, are the, are the muscles that are engaged in the posture. Okay, so the general one will be, if I'm just lying here, it's very easy. But if I want to activate my AROM, right, as we talked about just now, you want to rotate rotate the, the, the glutes downwards and then engage the abdominal muscles. And then you want to press the upper thigh into the mat. So some muscles to engage in that, in that stretch, in that, um, in that posture, makes it more beneficial rather than thinking, oh, I'm just staying here and doing nothing. So a lot of stretching done by athletes, um, I'm sure you've seen before, is very much, they just stay down there in their posture and actually is doing nothing much. Okay, so this is the, the progress progression uh, posture from Sphinx pose. So this one over here is on its elbow, same thing alignment here. And then, you know, you have modified ones where this one comes onto the thighs. Okay, so the pelvic and the belly is raised off. If you are familiar with these postures, these are still slightly um, safer, but cobra, high cobra posture like this, um, if there's back pain, you should avoid. Okay, so if you're not sure at all, then don't do this at all. This posture in black here is called the child's pose. Okay, for many stiff ankles, this is very painful. So one thing you can do, this is very calming for the whole body, but one thing you can do is to tuck the toes in or put a towel roll under the ankle there. Then you would ease off some, some uh, uh, tension. Okay, and then this is another... Um, variation of cobra. So one pose, but three, four variations. Over here, this is what it engages and the spine as well. So you can see that actually it's quite an active posture and it takes strength to stay in here. This is a strength, um, uh, this is a pose that actually can train up some strength and flexibility at the same time. Okay. Now, side bend that we're talking about, this one is slightly more passive, but Remember, if you engage the core, if you engage the side muscles here, and then you would, it would become a more active range. If you want to keep it passive for cool down or whatever, that's perfectly fine as well. You can also take this kind and just stay there. Okay, why is there a block over here? It's because when someone stands up here and engages and does this thing, it's very easy to just stand there and hold like that. But the standing part, nothing much is, is been done. So what this guy is doing here is he's trying to also engage his adductors muscles, the inner thigh muscles. Okay, by squeezing it, he's also actually trying to wake the, the thigh, inner thigh muscles up. It helps with the hip flexors, um, strengthening up the hip flexors. Okay, and why is he pulling this over here? Because he is trying to engage his core, same thing, keeping the shoulders open rather than collapsing. Okay, so just trying it yourself, you can actually feel the difference when if you actually give it a go. Okay, so forward fold, this is a very common sight here, poor thing, poor guy. If like, so this is a, a very good example. You can choose something elevated. If you don't have something like blocks, you can always sit on towels, thicker towels or blankets or cushions. And this might help someone who is quite stiff in the hamstrings. This happens because of tight hamstrings, okay? And tight back everything. And so elevating it might help with um, this person being able to sit upright. And this one targets a bit more parasitic tension because this body probably is quite used to sitting like this already when the legs are stretched out. Um, and so by putting a block down here can subconsciously or train the nervous system to help this person to sit more upright. The other way, of course, is to put something under the knees as well, just to keep the knees bent to ease off the hamstrings. Okay. And there's, it also can be done standing. When it's done standing, you can keep the knees bent. There's nothing wrong with having to try to reach the toes and you know, stretching all the way so long. And this lady is just holding the opposite elbows, letting the gravity take over and just allowing the whole back line over here to actually stretch, okay? I'm running through these exercises so that you have an idea why some yoga poses or actually yoga can actually help athletes and what it works on, all right? This is the core for sure, but if you realize this activates a lot more than the core, okay, all these red muscles are the ones that are engaged. And these are just some variations. It's very common for athletes uh, to end up on their tailbone and say, ah, I'm doing core work already. And very, it's very often that athletes come to me and say, 
core work over here doing yoga is a lot more intense than doing 300 reps of core work in, in the gym. Okay, it's very, very common because we really target the deeper, deeper muscles, um, even deeper than the ab, ab muscles to, to, you know, uh, to fire up the muscles that is inside to help stabilize the whole core. Probably last one, bridge pose, a very good back bend. Um, just now we saw some block, right? You can place a block in between the thighs as well, just to uh, activate and protect the lower back. So you protect the lower back by engaging the inner thighs when you raise this up. It's very easy for kids to just raise themselves up, but as we go older, as the athletes go stiffer, um, you really want to make sure that there's this engagement of the inner thighs when they press themselves up this way. Okay. Chuan, I know I'm running out of time. Do I have more time or should I end things Hello, off? Danica. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I see that you are near the end of the slides, mm. uh, your presentation deck. So uh, yes. please carry on until the end. Then thereafter, okay. we'll try to stretch it a little bit. Okay, uh, Ken. Since, uh, Thank you so much. Two slides ago. Ken, thanks. Okay, thanks for holding up uh, with me, everyone. Sorry, a bit lost also. <laughs> uh, okay, so applying yoga into training plan, I'll keep this for you to think about. What is your intention if you're interested to apply some yoga into your training plan? Okay, is it for cross-training? Uh, if it's for cross training means um, like let's say I do soccer right and maybe off season I want to do some yoga maybe once a week for eight weeks this can be part of your training plan as a cross training option second one is my intention for strength or is it uh, if it's for strength then what are some kinds of poses that can in uh, can help complement strength then for warm up or cool down or recovery cool down recovery uh, actually, cool down and warm up. Warm up is more dynamic, remember? And cool down can be a combination of both, but definitely more um, still passive range of motion kinds of stretch. For recovery, I took my word back just now because in recovery, sometimes both active and passive range of motion exercises can, can come into play. Um, the poses means if let's say you want to do it for recovery, then perhaps AROM and PROM poses and exercises are the ones that uh, you want to consider, you know, including into your training plan. The second thing to do is to think about is, do I want these elements? Okay, so let's say, for example, if I'm doing cool down, then perhaps it's a more still kind of practice and gentle, not so strong. If it is a cross training program, maybe a strong, a strong practice once every two weeks is okay. Maybe a combination. Okay, if let's say the the main aim is mental strength because or a combination of mental strength and something else uh, of strength, uh, physical and mental strength. Then uh, with regards to mental strength, it's, it's perhaps something that is more still to train uh, patients, to train mental resilience and dynamic movements can also train mental strength. Okay, having to engage the whole body parts that, are in, uh, that we are supposed to engage while trying to stay in those postures. Um, really, really important to think about. Okay, so if it's activation work, uh, that can be an element as well. Is it for relaxation, muscle tension? So think of what are some elements that might best suit your program if you are intending on applying it. Okay, then consider suitable help. Can I do it or not? If I cannot do it, um, uh, then perhaps I might want to find someone's help. And with the, earlier, with the earlier example I shared with you, even if you practice yoga yourself, it does not mean that we know the bodies of our athletes. Even if they are children, yes, they are children. However, there is yoga for children. And I myself don't teach yoga for very, very small children because the body is so different and the attention span is also very different. So it really depends on who your um, target audience is and whether you think you're able to treat, uh, do it yourself as well because you're also a yoga teacher, that's perfectly fine. But if it's not, then um, know the difference between yoga for athletes and yoga to athletes, okay? Yoga for athletes is yoga for them. Yoga to athletes is where if we were to train it, like we teach it personally, but it's more like our own practice based on our knowledge and we are teaching it to the athletes, but it may not be suitable for them, right? So your considerations, how can I help my athletes? Uh, what do I need to do? And where can I get my resources? Uh, is the, this training, is this teacher experience in the sport as well? Do they know the sport? 
do they actually know what are some of the, the muscles or the body parts that, that involve the types of movement in the sport? And can this person help me customize the program or do a program that, that can complement my program itself? Okay, so wrapping up. Um, the main thing I think I'm trying to share with you today is that yoga is not just for aesthetics only. It can also be for function. Okay, good mobility is always harder to engage as we talk about muscle inhibition and activation. Okay, uh, detrimental effects in repeatedly going to the end range of motion. This one I didn't share much, but basically when we go PROM, if we keep stretching towards the end and trying to stretch my and reach the legs, it may not be very healthy for the connective tissues in the end. Okay, and most importantly, of course, is to stay true to the coaching values and ethics of our own job. Okay, so thank you very much. I can catch your breath now. <laughs> okay, uh, Danica. <laughs> yes. Yep, thanks for your informative uh, sharing on how yoga training can help benefit, potentially benefit athletes. Mm. So we have collected one question off the Facebook. Yep. Okay, the question is, how about sports which require extreme range of motion, such as gymnastics and wushu? So, in a sense that how can mm. yoga training be used to help these athletes who are participating in these sports? Yes, so I think earlier on I did share a little bit about um, uh, sports like these. I didn't know that wushu also needs so, such up, oh, probably, yeah, lots of flexibility. And the answer to that is to work the strength element. Strength not to bulk up the whole body or to create more muscles because I understand, for example, uh, in, in gymnastics, especially rhythmic gymnastics, the sport needs you to, needs the athletes to be lean. So it's more about things like core, um, core activation exercises or, you know, strength-based, body, body weight strength-based exercises or very light resistance stuff, resistant band stuff or um, just working on the active range of motion. So these are some things to help uh, with the complementing the training of, of um, people who, or athletes who are actually a lot more flexible and already have that range. So if there's already a range there, then why not just tap on the strength element to complement? Because remember range of motion, not just only comes with the element of flexibility, but also the element of strength. Okay, uh, thanks, Danica. Yep. No so uh, there's no more questions. So I'll take over the sharing of the screen from here.